Hello, I'm meteorologist Nathan Kitchens with Convective Weather Storm Chasing and Forecasting. We are looking at really our first winter blast of the season across the central and eastern United States. Looking at some very chilly weather this weekend. We have finally some winter weather alerts to talk about. Winter storm warnings across parts of the upstate, uh, across parts of uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, even in, into north central Michigan. We have winter storm warnings and lake effect snow warnings and advisories across upstate New York. Certainly going to be uh, a very uh, wintry like next few days for those areas. Freeze warnings across the south as the growing season will certainly come to an end as we see sub freezing temperatures make it all the way to the Gulf Coast this weekend. Looking at some pretty hefty snowfall totals across uh, some of these Great Lakes over the areas over the next few days. These lakes are very warm, and I think this is going to be a significant lake effect snow season for these areas. This is just the beginning, folks, of what's to come. So this is a NAM model, what it's showing as far as total accumulated snowfall. It is showing a potential for several inches across parts of northern Michigan this weekend, across the, along the uh, Lake Michigan here, snow belt, seeing potential for some se several inches of snow. And it's a pretty hefty snow that it's printing out across upstate New York. It's printing out a lot of snow in some areas there off of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. Um, and even that snow goes down into Pennsylvania as well. So quite a few areas will be getting in on some of that snowfall over the next few days. Let's look at what the GFS model is showing. There's temperature anomalies. Clearly we're going to be below average across the east this weekend. But looking at this uh, potential for snow as we go throughout the next couple of days. So there's that system moving uh, surface low pressure moving through New England by tomorrow morning at uh, six or excuse me seven a.m. Eastern time. Low pressure just north of Boston there, and we have uh, snow behind that low pressure here in upstate New York. Some pretty heavy snow falling there, and then that cyclonic flow over those lakes, Lake Erie here, will be producing significant lake effect snowfall throughout the day Sunday, and that snow just continues across upstate New York as we go throughout Sunday afternoon. And in the Sunday evening, that low pressure moves farther north as we go into Monday and things uh, start to gradually settle down as we do go into early next week with another system lurking across the plains. All right, so let's get to the heart of what uh, this forecast update is all about. I'm posting a winter forecast from us uh, here at Convective Weather Storm Chase and Forecasting. going to kind of show you some background as to how I came up with this forecast for the winter and... Uh, it's going to be a very interesting forecast. So if you're, in case you've been curious about what we think the winter might hold for the United States, well, here we go. We're going to talk about it. And there's a lot of factors that play into this here. And first off, uh, as most of you know, we're in a La Nina, a very weak one at that. That's uh, delineated by those cooler than average waters there in the equatorial Pacific. And looking at the uh, temperature anomalies across the Pacific, you can see the tug of warmer waters here still along the west coast of the United States and even up into parts of Alaska that's indicative of a positive PDO and certainly a positive PDO is something you want if you want to uh, if you want wintry weather in the eastern United States certainly a positive PDO is something you want to see and a PDO is a lot more questionable this year look what we're seeing here in the northern Pacific a ton of very cool waters has developed here it continues to really intensify there in the north Pacific we've seen a very strong Pacific jet stream and this jet stream is not showing a whole lot of signs of breaking down too soon. And this is, a, this is going to be a big factor as we go throughout the next few weeks. We're seeing the pattern trying to become more favorable for cold, but there's a lot of questions regarding this specific jet stream because it's going to make it tough for cold air to really get bottled in and sustained across the United States. But we're seeing signs that that could start the weekend, and it's something we'll be watching as well. And I'm going to talk more about the PDO here in a second. But first off, we are in a weak La Nina. Again, you see those cooler waters there in the equatorial Pacific. Looking at the Nino index, we've been clearly overall in a weak La Nina. We had earlier this fall, there were really a lot of questions uh, raising regarding if La Nina was really going to take place because we actually went neutral for a while and the La Nina watch was canceled. Then they reissued that watch and we are officially now in a La Nina. But I tell you, it's a very weak one. Latest value is actually coming in at negative 0.4. 8, 7. So we are, again, you look at the negative 0.5 and plus 0.5 to kind of be the thresholds for the La Nina here and then the El Nino up here. So we're really kind of on that borderline. But overall, we are in a weak La Nina. How about the different models showing the La Nina predictions for the upcoming winter? Um, it looks like overall the La Nina is going to be, for one, weak and it's going to be short-lived. This is going to be a short-lived event. So that's kind of the interesting thing about this La Nina. It's going to be short-lived. 
Sun and so solutions. Some solutions say it's neutral by February. So there's uh, overall, I think it's safe to say that December and January we should see a weak La Nina overall. But by the time we get to February, the, uh, the there is more uncertainty regarding if we will still be technically in a La Nina or will we be neutral by that time. And it looks like La Nina will be over with by the spring, according to the model prediction. So this is like this is a map. This is Oceanic Nino Index. Basically, you can see different years where we've gone from strong El Ninos to strong La Ninas. Use some of these years to come up with an analog forecast for the winter. And one year that stands out to me, look at 97-98. We had a strong El Nino. The following winter of 98-99, we had a moderate La Nina. So that certainly is a remarkable uh, year to use for analog forecasting for this year. And we look at other years like uh, 66, 67, 67, 68, use years like 74, 75, um, so on and so forth. They come up with an analog forecast for the winter. And this is a map, this up here is the MEI, the multivariate ENSO index for the seven strongest El Nino events since 1950 versus 2015 and 16. And there's a list down here showing the different years where we had any, uh, you know, varying El Ninos and La Ninas. And certainly one of the biggest years I've used uh, is 90, the year of 98-99. You can see we had a very strong El Nino in 97-98. And in the following winter, we had a moderate La Nina there in 98-99. Um, obviously, in this case, for us this year, we're in a much weaker La Nina uh, versus that time frame. And then there's other years I've used in here as well. Come up with an analog forecast. Analog forecasting is very useful because we can look at what where our pattern is now, we look back in history and try to see when we had similar, similar conditions and what kind of weather did that bring. And this is where the analog forecasting comes in. And you can see, generally speaking, warmer than normal conditions are favored across parts of the southwest United States. We generally saw a cooler, uh, a cooler anomaly for the northern tire of states. La Nina, typical winter pattern. So we're, I said we're in a La Nina, right? So what does that necessarily mean for uh, the weather pattern across the United States this winter? What do we usually see during a La Nina? You recall last year we had a very strong El Nino, the opposite of La Nina. We had a very strong subtropical jet stream shooting into the southwest United States. You know, typically California will get a lot of rain during an El Nino. There were a lot of hopes that last winter that would happen. And yes, they got some rain, but I tell you what. They are still in a very, very severe drought. It really did not do anything much for their drought, unfortunately. And unfortunately, uh, uh, as we go into this winter, the overall pattern favors drier conditions across the south uh, part of the United States, dry and warm conditions from the Gulf Coast into the southwest, and wetter conditions along the Ohio Valley. And we also favor those cooler temperatures across the northern tier of states and into, into the Pacific Northwest. Very active pattern across the Pacific Northwest, typically during La Nina, with those wet, wetter conditions. And uh, looking at the uh, different highlights I have here, um, again, we have the polar jet stream is much more dominant during the uh, La Nina, and the subtropical jet stream is quiet. Uh, generally, we have weather conditions, those wetter to normal conditions for the Ohio Valley. That means a very active storm track there. And this can lead to interesting winter storm setups. Of course, that depends on potential phasing. Obviously, we can't forecast that right now, but uh, you know, that's something we'll have to watch this winter. Um, caveats. There's always caveats in the weather, right? Uh, I got to stress this, and I really want to make this clear. No two La Ninas are the same. I feel like sometimes there's a lot of broad brushing done in weather uh, because uh, a lot of times people will hear, oh, La Nina, so that means we're going to have a certain kind of weather for the winter. It doesn't necessarily work that way um, because the atmosphere is very chaotic, and very rarely will the atmosphere repeat itself just like it did before. It may be similar, but just because you're in a La Nina does not mean the pattern will necessarily resemble every aspect of what a La Nina typically brings. So I mentioned no two La Ninas are the same. Also, this La Nina is very weak. We're borderline neutral, weak La Nina, you know, we're in that kind of borderline there. So perhaps it's not a strong driver for the winter. Other factors may be a more dominant influence versus uh, the fact that we're in a technically a La Nina. So I mentioned a PDO index at the very beginning of this video, and let's talk about that. This is a PDO chart, daily PDO index chart. I actually got this off Weather and HUD. You can follow them on Twitter 
great, great, great uh, graphic, great uh, page they have there. Be sure to follow them. Um, this is looking at the PDO index from, uh, really, the daily index from March to where we are now. Uh, this was actually from last Friday, the November 11th. And you can see generally we had a very positive PDO. Let's think about this for a second. We had a very strong PDO last year, 15, year 15 and 16. Uh, and PDO, positive PDOs and El Nino's go hand in hand. It's very difficult to get a La Nina to develop when you're in a positive PDO. And if it does, it'll usually be very short-lived. And in this case, we're going to have a very short-lived La Nina, it appears, for the winter. I showed you those model forecasts. And there's been a lot of uncertainty regarding the PDO. While we've been strongly positive the past two winters, there's a lot more uncertainty this winter. You can see we actually dipped even towards below the neutral line there uh, in October, early October. Recent trends have shown a trend towards positive again, but we're not guaranteed a positive PDO this winter. And that's something I want to stress. There is some uncertainty there. And then the purple line also shows the Nino region average temperature. So you can also get the uh, idea here of the relationship between that and the PDO. Looking at the standardized PDO, there's a nine-month running average from 1950 to 2015. Basically, just showing you the different phases we've been in since 1950, positive and negative phases of the PDO. Clearly, we had a negative, strongly negative PDO right around 2011. You guys remember that. But I want to... Okay, so let me stop here for a second. A couple slides ago, I said La Nina typically uh, will have drier and, and warmer conditions across the south. Let's think about what happened in the winter of 2010 and 2011. What kind of weather did we see across the south in 2011? We actually had a lot more snowfall than normal across a lot of the south. Areas like Mississippi that don't normally get a lot of snow in the winter. Areas like Tennessee saw uh, several inches above average for the winter. That was a pretty hard-hitting winter for those areas, much more than they typically see, and it was colder as well. That's the opposite of what La Nina typically brings. And there you go. Like I said, La Nina, no two La Ninas are the same. And that's not the only factor we have to look at. So I want to stress that really clearly here in this forecast. And then you can look at the PDO, how it went positive again in uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, led to those colder winters. Obviously, last winter, that was all kind of overshooted, overdriven by that very, very, very strong El Nino that we had. And this is looking at the Arctic, Arctic sea ice extent. Um... Another thing we can look at here, we're really running behind this year versus other years. This is looking at the extent uh, here, the Arctic sea ice extent, and uh, we're looking at, uh, we, had, we, we typically see a buildup of the ice during the fall and into the winter. Uh, obviously, as temperatures get colder, uh, one of the least ice extent years was actually 2012. You can see that was actually the lowest here around the month of August and September. 2012 had a very, very, very low ice extent. And that was during the summer that we had just uh, ridiculous heat across the United States that summer. You guys remember that. 2016 had been running close to where we had been last year as far as the CS extent. But look at what's happened recently. We've actually gone below those values of what we saw um, back in even in 2012 when those values were so low. We're even lower now. So we have a very low Arctic sea ice extent compared to other years. And obviously over time, this has been in a gradual uh De decline because of global warming, but obviously this is going to vary from year to year for sure. Uh, but for what it's worth, the Siberian uh, snow cover is very extensive and it's been very uh, extended very early this year. So that's another factor to keep in mind as well that could be favorable for um, for winter weather across the United States. Another thing we look at. So I just want to keep in mind there's so many different indicators I could throw in here. I could talk about indicators from left to right for 24 hours straight, but um, we got to get real here and get. Uh, try to bring this as brief as possible. So there's, there's another factor I could show you, the recurring Rossby wave train, and I've just posted this for various cities for the winter. Rossby waves are large-scale waves that rotate around the globe, and now models track these to try to, to try to find a pattern that may repeat itself later in time. I think this is really fascinating. It's just a tool, and I, you know, I, I can't say how accurate it is because I don't know, but I do, I do think it's very interesting, and it's a tool that's becoming more popular, part of the organic forecasting. I got these charts off of organicforecasting.com. I encourage you, if you're a weather buff, to be sure to check those websites out. I kind of enjoy looking at all that data. Uh, basically, just kind of looking at different cities here for the precipitation chances in the winter. Uh, it basically just shows Indianapolis versus Louisville. Indy would have a more favorable chance for a lot of snow systems this winter because of them being more entrenched to the cold air. I think areas like Louisville, Kentucky, and the Ohio Valley would be a little more on the borderline. 
uh, between, say, a snow event versus ice versus rain, so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to get to the whole national map here in a minute. So if you're, say, you're out west or somewhere far away and you're wondering what the weather's going to be like in your area, I'm going to post the entire map of the United States. I want to forecast here shortly, so just stay tuned. I gotta get through a couple more indicators here, and I, I wanted I can't talk about the winter without talking about the drought because I think this is significant, especially across. Uh, for one, the drought has been very extensive across the Northeast this summer. It's been dry, it's been hot, and also across the South, the drought has really, really uh, intensified and expanded across that area, even extending ex extending into the Ohio Valley now, uh, as well. We have an exceptional drought across parts of Georgia, southeast Tennessee, central, northern Alabama. That's the worst drought category you can get. And uh, Birmingham technically broke their six. I, think, I believe they had 61 straight days without rain. They had a hundredth of an inch. I mean, come on, a hundredth of an inch last night. But hey, that was enough to break their record dry, break the break their dry streak. So I guess that's something. And I think it's just the beginning of what's to come. We have a little more of an active pattern starting to show up that's going to finally help these guys out. But it's going to take a long time to get out of this drought because it has gotten so bad. In fact, I think Chattanooga, Tennessee, if I looked right, I think they need about 20 inches of rain to break out of their drought. Now, I think of Birmingham, it's a, more like maybe a foot of rain versus Chattanooga needing like 18, 19 inches of rain to break out of the drought. So the bottom line is... Uh, it's going to take a while to get out of this drought, that is for sure. And when you get a drought, you tend to get natural high pressure over drought areas. This is a positive feedback loop. It can be very difficult to break these down because drought, there's a saying, drought begets drought. Drought reinforces drought. Um, it can be very, very difficult to break out of these patterns. I think we will gradually, but because it's so severe, I just don't know how... Uh, you know, quickly this will break up. And also because we're in a La Nina, I just mentioned La Nina is typically are drier and warmer across the south, and I think that will be true for the winter. So I still think the drought's going to be a very, very, very big influence this winter, not just for the south, but it's going to affect the entire United States because I think it's going to really intensify the southeast ridge. And um, let's get right into it now. Here's the temperature forecast for the winter. I'm going to talk snow here in a minute as well. I think overall I'm going to favor a colder than average idea for the north uh, across the Great Lakes into the, the far northern entire of states. And then I have equal chances from roughly the mid-Atlantic through the much of the Ohio Valley and into the uh, northwest there, uh, kind of the north central Rockies there, uh, equal chances. But I also think that much of the south is going to uh, favor warmer than normal. And then I think much warmer than normal across the desert southwest this winter. So that's temperatures. Storm tracks for the winter. Uh, we'll see clippers coming down across the northern tire of states as we typically see there in the winter, but also I think we're going to have a very active storm track shooting through the Ohio Valley. Go out, these storm systems will be going on the uh, edge of that strong ridge here across the southeastern United States. And let's get right into the snowfall forecast now. I'm going to favor a lot of snow this winter across the Great Lakes. I think this is going to be a really a jackpot for snow this winter. You guys, if you want snow and you're living in the Great Lakes right now, I think you should be rejoicing because you're going to get some good snowfall this winter. But I don't have any much question about that. I'm going to favor several inches above average during that dark blue shading from the Dakotas down through the uh, Ohio Valley here. You're probably looking at this and saying, what in the world is he doing? Why does he have this random you know, blotch out here that extends way out here? Well, I'm accounting for, I think there's going to be an active storm track here. And I think there's going to be more snowfall. Again, it's not going to work out perfect. This is just a general idea of snowfall totals. Uh, a, a general idea that we're going to have an active storm track there. And I also think that's going to be a battleground zone here in this area. Across the Ohio Valley, down into the Ozarks of Missouri, down into Arkansas, maybe Oklahoma. The, um, a battle zone for ice storms and uh, different types of precipitation could be a, a very headache. It could be a lot of headaches this winter, I should say, when it comes to trying to predict these systems. And uh, I think the south will be just dry and generally much warmer than average for the winter with that southeast ridge dominating. These systems will be tracking um, on the edge of that ridge. There will be a strong temperature difference from cold air to the north. As I showed you here in the temperature forecast, a lot of cold air up here, but the cold air is not going to get itself entrenched way down to the south like it's, we see sometimes during the winter. I think it's going to come south and just kind of get, you know, come down to an extent. And then we see a warmer than average regime across the south. There will be systems, storm systems riding along that t temperature difference, that temperature uh, difference, di density differences. That's how these storm systems develop, the cyclogenesis. And I think that we're going to have an active storm track there between those two temperature differences there for the winter. Okay, well that's going to wrap it up for the winter forecast from Go Back to Weather.